How y'all doing today? Pretty good. So quick show of hands. Who here has already used Apple 9? If you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll get into that. All right, a few people. Uh, what about Apple 8? Some of the same people. Apple 7? Same folks? Okay. People, so some of y'all know, know about it and you used it for a while. What about uh, Apple 6? Yeah. 5? Apple 4? <laughs> All right, some people have been with us from the beginning. Very cool. All right, well that sets the stage for what, uh, oh, sorry, one more show of hands. Who here has waited to migrate or start deploying the next uh, major version of their OS until packages they needed were available in Apple? Pretty much all those same people that have used it before, right? It's a common problem. So that sets the stage for what we're gonna talk about today, the road to Apple 9. My name's Carl George. I am the CPE team, uh, C the team lead for the Apple team inside CPE, and I've got a slide about what that is if you don't know that acronym. Acronyms are terrible. There's too many. So, for what is Apple? Based on the show of hands, some of y'all already know, but for anyone that's new or not has been exposed to it before, uh, Apple stands for Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux. It's an initiative within the Fedora project to provide additional packages for CentOS and RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. The, the whole goal is to just do those extra packages to enhance the base distribution without replacing or disturbing anything in that distribution. Well, where do those packages come from? The simple answer is Fedora. Got a little diagram up here. It's not to scale. There's way more than 90 <laughs> packages in Fedora. <laughs> but it's, it's roughly proportional about the amount of packages that get branched off to become CentOS and RHEL, and then everything else that's not in that subset of packages is eligible to go into Apple, the Apple repository. If a package is later added to RHEL, like in one of the minor versions that gets uh, released later, then we'll, we'll remove it from Apple because we don't want to duplicate or conflict with anything. Um, from the Fedora side, it's still built in the Fedora infrastructure and it's just another branch on the package source repository. So if you went to browse it, you'd see like a Fedora 39 branch, a 38 branch, and maybe an Apple 9 branch and an Apple 8 branch, depending on what it's been built for. So I talked about how RHEL and CentOS are built from Fedora. How that happens has changed a little bit in recent years. You might have heard about it. No. Yeah. <laughs> CentOS has moved upstream of RHEL, also known as CentOS Stream, which is a terrible name. I hate it, but that's what it is. Um, for, most, for the rest of this talk, when I say CentOS, I'm going to be talking about CentOS Stream. I'm just, to do it faster, I'm just going to say the one, one word. Um, if I'm talking about the old model, I'll, I'll clarify the old classic rebuild CentOS. So in the past, CentOS was that. It was a rebuild of RHEL source code, and that's useful. People can use it, but the problem with that is we called it a bug-for-bug bug rebuild. That meant that anything in there that wasn't exactly matching RHEL wasn't a bug. So you could find a legitimate bug with it, even send a contribution for it, and the maintainers would just have to close it as like, nope, that's also a bug in RHEL, so it's not a bug for us. So it's... Yes, it's useful and you can use it, but it's completely as is and you can't participate in it. You can't make it better. You can't even tell, them, tell the maintainers what's wrong with it because they'll just say, okay, close, works as expected. It's not a good experience for the maintainers or the users. That has changed though. With CentOS moving upstream of RHEL now, now people can actually contribute into CentOS. The CentOS maintainers can actually fix bugs. And neat fact, all the RHEL maintainers are now the CentOS maintainers. And oftentimes they also maintain the package in Fedora, so they're maintaining the same software, and they're also usually involved in the upstream projects. So when you file a bug with CentOS or RHEL or Fedora, you're talking to somebody that has a holistic view of the whole software ecosystem and where things need to go, fixes that are upstream that may need to be backported, all of that. I said that, I mentioned that it's still very similar to RHEL. It's just barely upstream of it. It leads it by about six months. Uh, I've actually t gone through and measured the software versions in it at different points in time, and it's usually 90 to 95 percent the same. So it's still very, very close. It's actually, all, interestingly enough, it's basically the reference, public reference implementation of the RHEL compatibility standard. So you'll hear a lot about that, about being RHEL compatible. That is defined in CentOS, and that's what everything, even RHEL itself, is following after. And it's, but it is still, even though it can change a little bit, it's still bound by the RHEL compatibility rules. What goes into CentOS is going to be in RHEL probably in about six months. And so it's as different from RHEL as RHEL is from one minor version to the next. 
So it's not a completely different thing. It's just getting a little bit ahead so we can fix that bug for bug problem. So RHEL is very, very stable, but it's not completely frozen. Sometimes we have minor libraries that change in minor versions of RHEL. And when that happens, that might have a cascading effect where an Apple package that's separate from RHEL needs to be rebuilt against the new library so that it works correctly. In the old model, in the rebuild days, CentOS would lag about a month behind RHEL. And we had this problem where if a library changed in RHEL and the Apple package needed to be rebuilt to work for it, then the maintainer could rebuild it right away, which would break it on CentOS but fix it for RHEL users, or they could ignore it and leave it broken for RHEL users for, until CentOS caught up about a month later and leave it working for CentOS users, which neither of those choices is good. It's, it's just compromising both ways. But because it was only about a month gap, it was mostly ignored for most of history and just kind of worked with it. We had one Apple and it just was consumed everywhere. And it wasn't a super com common problem either. Those library changes, it wasn't every single minor version and it wasn't every single package. It was usually just a handful of things that wouldn't install correctly. So in the new model, the, those changes that go into RHEL releases, they're available in public in CentOS you know, three to six months early. So we started noticing that and uh, that gap that was only a month now was like three to six months where something very small and subtle will be different that would make a package from Apple either work on CentOS or work on RHEL. And actually at the time, we didn't have a way to build those Apple packages against CentOS. So they only stayed working on RHEL and then CentOS was, it was just broken for CentOS users for three to six months. We didn't like that. That, that wasn't, wasn't really acceptable. A month wasn't really acceptable either, but it was not a big enough problem at the time for people to dedicate resources to work on and fix. So that longer gap made the problem harder to ignore. These diagrams right here are interesting. You can see that each, each version of CentOS is basically the major version that each of the RHEL minor versions branches off of. Right now, we're right about here. 9.3 has branched, which Brendan's gonna correct me on the terminology, but it's close enough. Um, 9.3, RHEL 9.3 is coming out soon, in a month or so, something like that. Yeah. Roughly six months after RHEL 9.2 came out. Um, that's a new schedule they're on too, is every six months is a new RHEL minor version, every three years is a new RHEL major version. So talking about that gap problem, we came up with a solution for that called Apple Next. And just the simple way to phrase it is that we were going to start building some Apple packages against CentOS when needed. Not all of it, not all of Apple, um, and it wasn't a complete duplication. It's just going to, it was just a different build target and a different repository for whenever one of those packages had, you know, linked against the library that was different between the RHEL minor versions, between what was public in CentOS and what was currently in the RHEL minor version, and it needed to have separate builds for it. Proposed that in September 2020, and then uh, we rolled it out, finalized it in June 2021 for the public, and it mostly solved the problem. RHEL users could use Apple and get packages that were compatible, and CentOS users could use CentOS with Apple and then also Apple Next and get a couple of packages that were a newer release that were compatible with the current libraries that were in CentOS. And so that mostly worked. Uh, I'll talk about some of the downsides of it later on a later slide. So earlier during the show of hands, we talked about the, the, minor ver the major version migrations and being held up waiting for the, package, the community packages you need to be available. The actual amount of content in RHEL in, in CentOS is pretty small. And so a lot of people come to depend on those packages that are in the extra, extra packages repo. And we were consistently getting that feedback that I know these packages aren't supported by Red Hat, and, but I still depend on them and I'm not mi migrating or starting to deploy the next major version until those are available. We kept getting that feedback over and over. And at the time, no one in Red Hat was paid to work on Apple directly. There were people like me that cared about it that were on different semi-related teams, but nobody was actually paid to focus 100% on Apple at the time. But we changed that because we kept getting that feedback that RHEL customers were saying, I'm not upgrading off of RHEL 7 until all of these things I need are in Apple 8 or Apple 9, and I'll migrate to one of the two. So I mentioned CPE on my introductory slide, and here's the definition of that acronym, Community Platform Engineering. It's a, a group or a team inside Red Hat. That's where I work. And um, it started in 2017 
with the merger of the Fedora and CentOS engineering teams, and then um, done various other initiatives over time since then. At the time, whenever we decided to actually staff Apple, I was working on this team on the CentOS side, CentOS sub team of it, and uh, my VP asked me like, "Hey, uh, would you? What do you think about starting an Apple team and being the team lead for it?" And I was like, "Yeah, actually, that's really excited. That's actually how I got started in Fedora, so that would be a great thing to work on." And that gave us the opportunity to actually prioritize Apple and plan ahead, not just be reactionary. And at the time that happened, this happened after we did Apple Next. So I, I, I came up with the idea for Apple Next and we basically rolled it out, not just me, but other people helped. We rolled it out before this even was a thing. I was, that wasn't even my main job, I was just doing it. So they're like, you, are, you clearly care about Apple, would you like to lead this team? So first thing we wanted to work on, uh, we knew CentOS Stream 9 and RHEL 9 were coming out very soon. So we knew we had to do something to get Apple 9 ready. And based on the feedback of like, we're always waiting on these packages, we wanted to do something around that. So we had an original plan. And bear with me, it's a little complicated to explain, hence the image. But we were going to launch Apple 9 Next first, build against CentOS 9. And then after the RHEL 9 launch, rebuild all of those packages that maintainers had added against RHEL 9 and use that to populate Apple 9. And then we would launch Apple 9 quickly within a couple of days or weeks after RHEL 9. That made sense to us from the implementation side and the infrastructure side. But as we got to trying to explain it and document it for users, uh, we realized that it wasn't really, uh, didn't really make a lot of sense to people. Um, we were trying to explain it and to the packagers, it was confusing because we were telling them build against Apple 9 Next for about, for about six months. And then after the Apple 9 launch, primarily build for Apple 9, except when you need Apple 9 Next when you need to. And that's already a long sentence and confusing me just saying it. <laughs> and, and then for users, it was also confusing because we, were we could tell them that you can use Apple 9 Next only for CentOS at first for six months, but then after the RHEL 9 launch, you need to pay attention for when we actually launch Apple 9 and then switch to that primarily. And if you're using it on CentOS, keep the Apple Next repo enabled, but if you're using it on RHEL, don't keep it enabled because you're going to get builds that only work on CentOS. So it's just a whole mess. Um, it's hard to explain. Um, I always hate this slide because I'm re-explaining it and I'm like, this is why we didn't do it this way. Um, it was even worse to try and document it. We were trying to not, you know, the, pro all, the common problem is documentation. All, you know, everyone's bad at it. You know, we all have room to improve on it. And we were trying to get ahead and actually document this a little bit ahead of time. And it was just very, very hard to explain. Um, we also, that, there, this plan also would have the extra complexity of doing a mass rebuild, um, which is something that the Fedora infrastructure team is familiar with, but it's still extra work and extra things that can go wrong. Uh, the biggest problem that we noticed with this, though, was that despite all the complexity, if we could work around that with documentation and help people through it, but Apple, the actual Apple 9 repo wasn't going to be available on RHEL 9 launch day. And we kept having people tell us, like, that's a problem. Why are we investing in this? Like, you should fix this problem. We want Apple 9 ready day one. So I started thinking about how we could actually accomplish that. So we changed the plan and simplified it. We just launched Apple 9, and then for the first six months, we built it against CentOS 9 which was kind of a revolutionary idea at the time. There was a little bit of, not really pushback, but some caution and skepticism within people that work on Apple uh, because they're like, well, Apple has always meant building against RHEL. And I countered that with, we are telling people that what's in CentOS right now is RHEL 9.0 content. Like, this is your early preview of RHEL 9.0, and if, if building against CentOS is incorrect, then that means we're you know, breaking a promise there or making a mistake there that something's wrong. And there, there's always a possibility for that. Bugs happen, but it's something we could fix. I argued that it would be a small enough chance or no chance and that we could just build those packages against CentOS 9 for six months and then on the RHEL 9 launch day, switch the build route from CentOS to RHEL and not even, not even tell you, package maintainers and users about it, just switch it over. And then we would still have Apple 9 Next built against CentOS 9 for those you know, exceptions where you do need to have a different package build. So this new plan had a lot of benefits. Apple 9 was the primary target the whole time. Package maintainers didn't have to think about Apple 9 next most of the time. They could just start building for Apple 9 and go. Um, they would only use Apple 9 next when needed, which is the same way that Apple 8 next was already working, that we'd already rolled out. And there was no change halfway through in the workflow. 
It was also a simple message to the users. You can just start using Epl9. Um, we set up a mechanism for CentOS users to get the Epl9 Next repo added uh, via a recommends in the packaging. So it was just transparent for them to get that. And we also, taking this approach, we didn't have to do a mass rebuild. We said that rebuilding these packages, you know, is probably overkill because we should be able to build it against CentOS this day and it work on RHEL 9 in, you know, four, five, six months. So that's what we bet on and that's the way we went, went through with it. Um, and that let us get Apple 9 out on, or what it gave us was having Apple 9 available right there on day one with as many packages as people could add. Uh, the focus of my team, it started with just me, it's two people now. We're luckily actually getting to uh, get a third person for part of the Apple 10 bring up. So that's exciting. But the, you know, a, a handful of people, we're never going to be able to just build everything under the sun. That's not the way we can make this better, just to handle it ourselves. We wanted to improve the infrastructure, improve the workflows so that the entire Fedora community and Apple community of packagers could get in there, add the things they care about, and get them ready. So we launched Apple 9, um, and we were able to launch it, you know, using that revised plan about six months before RHEL 9, like five and a half. And that gave maintainers all that extra time to add their packages, and it was only possible because of the changes to CentOS, let us do this. So it was pretty well celebrated. There was a few negative responses, um, mainly people saying, how could you call this ready? What about these packages that I use? Why didn't you think about my use case? And my standard response to that was that, well, Apple is not a content, it's a, set of, a specific set of content, it's the repository, and if there's something you think is missing, go ask for it. We have, we wrote up a, a guide, I mentioned trying to, trying to get ahead of the documentation a little bit. We did a whole walkthrough about how to request an Apple package. Um, we commonly would see like, well, this package was in Apple 8, why did you forget to put it in Apple 9? I didn't forget anything. Go talk to the maintainer of that package and ask him if he's willing to maintain it in another Apple branch. And that actually, that's something that has been in older, previous Apple branches also. That wasn't a new concept. We just exposed it a little more by having Apple 9 out so early. Um, every Apple branch, the maintainer has to, gets to decide, I am, I am or I'm not going to maintain the package in this branch, or which, even which version to do. A lot of times when we're adding packages to Apple, we may take the very latest version from Fedora Rawhide, or we may use one a few versions back. It depends on the libraries that are available to you in that release. So it's a, it's a nuanced process and not just something that we can just automatically throw at it and say, good enough. So about six months after that, we actually, uh, RHEL 9 had its release. And on that day, we had about 5,700 packages uh, built from about 2,600 source packages. If anyone's not familiar with those terms, uh, the pack packages are what you install. Uh, the source packages, that's what the maintainers generally work with. Uh, a good example would be like if you've seen like curl and curl devil and libcurl on your system. Those are all obviously related software. They're built from one source RPM, but it's multiple packages in the end. Um, most of the infrastructure tools will count by the source package, but the users will see the number of actual packages in the repo, which is why those have those two different numbers there. And uh, that was... Uh, at, by that point, most of, the, most of the naysayers of, well, why is Apple 9 missing this? Why is it missing this? They had gotten their request in or, or just gone away and somebody else had done the request and the maintainer added it. So we had a good number of packages, um, pretty well celebrated at the, at the RHEL 9 launch at Red Hat Summit, and uh, got a good, lot of good publicity from that. So how is Apple 9 doing now? It's growing faster than ever. Um, just un we got just under 18,000 um, packages from a little over 6,000 source packages. Um, you can see that, don't worry about the tiny text on the chart, but just look at the trend lines. This is Apple 7 and how it petered off. Here is Apple 8, where it kind of uh, lagged a little bit. And Apple 9 is just rocketed up. It's up, got more packages than Apple 8 now. And it doesn't have more source packages than Apple 7. That's this chart. But the actual binary, the end, end user packages is actually higher than Apple 7 already. So it's going really well there. Quick bonus talk, I'm gonna speed run through this one, and if you wanna know more about this, uh, come and talk to me after. Also, I have stickers that I can give out too, CentOS and Apple, and uh, some good, good little goodies there. So, the big idea for Apple 10, uh, 
again, that's the focus of my team is not just adding individual packages and just being a package machine, but how do we make it better and improve it overall? So the idea was that with uh, RHEL has minor versions, right? Apple 7 completely ignored that fact. That month gap I talked about where the package would either be broken on RHEL or broken on CentOS for a month, that just wasn't very good. Um, Apple 8 and Apple 9 couldn't really completely ignore it because of the CentOS changes, and that's where we got Apple Next. Um, but really it was kind of a bolted on solution that was less than ideal. And so I started thinking about this and thought that the, really the path forward, we're targeting two minor versions of RHEL with Apple and Apple Next. So let's just embrace that and not just do those two minor versions, but do every minor version and just have two of them active at a time. If you want to read the whole original proposal, this short URL will take you there, red.ht slash apple10, if it's really interesting to you, or if you want to get involved with it. So these are the slides I want to go real quick through. The Apple 7 branch structure was just Apple 7 built against RHEL 7.0. The disk tag is part of the version field in the, uh, the version string, which includes the release in the package, was .el7, and it populated an Apple 7 repo. And then main maintainers just used the Apple 7 branch and didn't think about it. When RHEL 7.1 came out, the build root got switched, and it got switched through every minor version. And then here we are today, being built against 7.9, and it's just kind of static mm -hmm. at this point. There, you, there's still some packages being added, but it's... Uh, RHEL 7 is in the very last phase, uh, part of its life cycle. It goes into life next year. So for Apple 8, it started out the same way. Switched to 8.1 and then 8.2 and 8.3. With, around 8.4 was when we added the Apple Next uh, idea. So we had an Apple 8 Next branch built against CentOS 8. It got a slightly different disk tag. Got the .next suffix to be different. And then it populated a separate repo path. And we kept it that way uh, on through the the rest of uh, RHEL 8's life cycle is still going. Uh, we're right about here now. 8.9 is about to come out very soon. And uh, after, after that, when 8.10 comes out, we're going to retire Apple 8 next because that's whenever CentOS 8 it has its end of life. It's about, it's about five years instead of the 10 years of RHEL now. So for Apple 9, we started it a little different, what I mentioned in the earlier slides. We started with the Apple 9 branch built against CentOS 9 with EL9 disk tag in the repo path. And then at the launch day, we switched the build root, not just switching minor versions, essentially switching minor versions, but we switched it from CentOS 9 to RHEL 9.0. And then we had the Apple 9 Next repo that continued to be built against CentOS 9, mirroring the way we had Apple 8 Next. And then that moved along, same exact way that uh, 8 has, just starting from the beginning. And then at the 9.10 point, uh, Apple 9 Next will get retired, because that'll be the CentOS 9 end of life date. So, quick retrospective over Apple Next. I mentioned it wasn't really ideal. It solved the basic problem and allowed packagers to target both RHEL and CentOS at the same time, even if there was a slight library difference. And it, we implemented it without disturbing any of the existing workflows. Uh, maintainers could completely ignore Apple Next, keep packaging for Apple, and maybe they'd get lucky and none of their packages would be affected and not be installable. And so, uh, it, went up, it was pretty smoothly integrated, but we kept having to reintroduce it to people that had ignored it because we made it easy to ignore. Some of those common problems we saw with it was that it was regularly mistook, mistaken for a standalone repository. Uh, some maintainers would build for both repos when they didn't need to and the libraries were all identical, or the, the affected libraries that for that package needed for dependencies. Um, and there was a decision process for the maintainer about when they needed to use it. Uh, probably the biggest problem was that we had, there was no inheritance between Apple Next to Apple. If a maintainer rebuilt a package in Apple Next to get it compatible with changes in CentOS, when the same changes hit RHEL, they had to redo all of that work. When it's one package, it's not a big deal. When it's like hundreds of packages in KDE, <laughs> Neil's nodding furiously back there, it's a real pain in the rear. So we wanted to, Fedora has a mechanism where you rebuild it for a library change in Fedora Rawhide and it can just be inherited in the next branching of Fedora. So I thought, that's a good idea. How can we bring that model, that inheritance into Apple? So the Fedora branch structure works like this. Um, just got the different 37, 38 branches. Fedora Rawhide, it uses the disk tag of 30, well, at the time, a little while ago, it used 39 as the disk tag as sort of a preview of what Fedora 39 is going to be. Very similar to how, Cento, like right now, CentOS 9 is a preview of what RHEL 9.4 is going to be. And as things move forward through time, 
you know, Fedora, Fedora Rawhide gets switched to the 40 disk tag, 39 gets its own branch and ma maintenance starts happening there directly um, and things just cycle through naturally. So that's what I wanted it, want it to bring to Apple 10. We'll start Apple 10, built against CentOS 10, just straight through. Uh, we'll use a disk tag, including the minor version. And then when RHEL 10 comes out, the Apple 10 branch will start using the uh, underscore one for the minor version. And then the Apple 10.0 branch, just fully leaning into the minor versions, will keep using the 10 underscore zero. Anything that was previously built in, at this point will just populate the 10.0 repo on day one and just be inherited. And it'll keep moving forward through time. We'll have an Apple 10.1 branch and a 10.2 branch and on and on and on throughout the life cycle of minor versions. And then at the very end, we'll have, when RHEL 10.10 comes out, uh, we'll either just have the Apple 10 branch uh, be, built, be targeted for it, or we'll do a 10.10 branch. We're not really sure which way we're gonna go through with it yet. But uh, that model is going, we're hoping that model makes it a lot more intuitive for maintainers. They can maintain their packages sim more similar to how they do in Fedora. Um, this new plan for Apple 10 has been approved by the Apple Steering Committee, and we're going working out all the specific details right now. Um, if you're interested in this at all, come talk to me, and there's several other people here that can help you get started becoming a package maintainer in Fedora, which is the gateway to being a package maintainer in Apple, uh, or even just if you have questions about how to talk to the maintainers, follow those bugs, that guide we talk, I talked about. Um, we also, the steering committee that I mentioned that approved this, uh, we have a weekly meeting if you want to show up there and ask questions or run ideas by, if you have other ideas about how to make this better, come and talk to us. I think I'm pretty much used 29 minutes, so. Thank you, Carl.